here with us in studio. And um, I don't know if I could say we are uh, honored to have her, uh, but uh, we certainly do appreciate uh, her giving us some time nonetheless. Uh, She is, without question, one of the most controversial figures in recent American history, and also, without question, rightly or wrongly, one of the most influential. Her ideas have really been immortalized now in culture, and the institution, the organization she created, known today as Planned Parenthood, is one of the most powerful political operations in these United States of America. Her name is Margaret Sanger, and we want to welcome Margaret to the program. I don't know, do you want to go by Margaret, Miss Sanger? I, we're probably not friendly enough for me to call you Margie, uh, but uh, out of respect and deference to you, I'm fine referring to you however you'd like to be referred to tonight. Mrs. Sanger would be fine. Mrs. Sanger would be fine. Thank you, Mr. Dace. Uh, you're welcome, and you can call me Steve. Uh, I'm only 39. Anybody that calls me Mr. Dace makes me feel like I'm 60. No offense to you, you're a lot older than that. Um, First and foremost, as someone that is, well, let's go to the top here, Mrs. Sanger. Are you fine being referred to as both controversial and influential? Do you think that is a fair characterization of you? You know, Mr. Dace, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about those type of labels because I find my work to be much more important than that. And so I see myself more um, as someone who is born as a humanitarian. You see yourself as a humanitarian. Absolutely. Um, I don't like to see people suffer, and I don't like to see cruelty. And as you may know, I am a nurse by training, and so I have seen so much unnecessary suffering. And so I have met many desperate women anxious for help, not wanting to have children again after just having a child or an abortion, and you know, coming to me for something um, to help them with that. And I feel very much as this is an important humanitarian effort to be able to alleviate their suffering. So you view you view the killing of unborn children um, as a humanitarian effort, or do you not think we're killing children, Mrs. Sanger? You know, most of my work, of course, um, was at the beginning, of course, was birth control. And um, my understanding is that... Um, You know, what we really need in this world is voluntary motherhood. And um, if we have birth control, then we will not have abortions. And, um, you know, I have seen where women have been placed in society and family and Mm -hmm. their maternal function has really made them to be brood animals in a masculine world. And so because of her perpetuation of reproduction, she has perpetuated the tyrannies of the earth. I don't know if you understand that, that she is creating these overpopulations, which all the horrors of overpopulation that we know of. And she's laid the foundation for racial unrest. Women have also unknowingly created slums, filling asylums with the insane and institutions with other defectives. She's repl- defectives. Defectives. Um, People that, you know, define that place, you know, defectives, we call them dysgenic. Um, Anyone that uh, we believe that they will not have a full life. They may not. They may have diseases from their parents. They um, may be poor. They may be immigrants. They may be those people that um, for which they should not continue to have children. You know, one of the things of birth control is so that we can have children from those that are fit, not from the unfit. So I want to make sure, I don't, because what I think I just heard you say is so breathtaking, I don't want to over-exaggerate it, all right? And, I, and out of deference to you being willing to be open and transparent by being here with us tonight, I want to make sure that you are being, uh, we're, we're taking you in context. You literally believe, you are literally telling our audience here tonight that you don't believe human beings have an inherent worth just by, regardless of the circumstances of their creation, how they were born, what they're born into, or what they're born with, but really their worth is found in their quality of life, whether anybody intended to bring them into life. And if those don't meet a certain, those those citizens don't meet a certain standard, it is okay, therefore, to abort them, to kill them. Is that what I hear you saying? That's what makes them defective? You're absolutely right. Um, However, what I would say is that 
we are more focused on the front end with birth control to prevent them to even coming into the world, knowing full well that, that women will commit infanticide or they will commit an abortion. So if we can stop at the beginning, then we won't have to have those particular... All right, so so you want to dam the river at its source, so to speak, but you have no problem after the fact if someone slips one past the goalie, so to speak, you have no problem, therefore, with the woman ending that pregnancy, right? Well, you know, I know some people would call that a sin or murder, but, you know, um, it is a, a very bad thing, but I don't know that I'd go so far as to call it a sin. How do we know? What is, is there an objective standard, Mrs. Sanger, that we know that someone is defective according to your definition? How, what is, how do you know what that standard is? How do you know that that standard is accurate? For example, I was born to a 15-year-old mother, and um, she was very poor, white trash probably, people would have considered her at the time, and now I'm one of the youngest nationally syndicated radio hosts in the United States of America. It's, but by your definition, it sounds as if she would have, I, I could have been defective, it would have been okay to abort me and thus not have any of the three children I went on to have? You'd be okay with that? Well, as you know, um, I was a very uh, um, staunch proponent of the eugenics board, and they would have absolutely looked at your situation and determined that um, not only was your mother unfit because she was not having a child in wedlock and she was not capable of taking care of that child and it would be defective and really a waste on the you know the hard earning um, workers that we have now so um, it would be a drain on the system so to speak that she'd probably be sterilized or maybe even segregated at that point I am I, I'm, I'm I'm speechless this is very clinical to you I don't I don't sense any emotion. Um, I don't sense a lot of femininity. This seems very clinical to you. I mean, we're there's no nurturing here. I mean, we're talking about babies, well, there, as if we're talking about commodities or stocks. We're talking about human beings here, aren't we? There's a, there's two aspects to this that I think is important that people understand is that when we talk about voluntary motherhood, I think, and the idea that we are going to be creating a new race. You know, we're, we're looking for the fittest. We're looking for, you know, breeding the thoroughbred, um, the Superman. Um, when you look at that and you have voluntary motherhood, then you have women that are more free to be who they are and to self-actualize and, and to really become more, a better mother. And so if she's able to be freer in her sexuality and in her life and the choices that she makes, then we will absolutely have a better um, child born and we will have a better society so killing your own children makes you a better mother for those that are unfit you use the word eugenics quite a bit and frankly most of what i know about eugenics comes from star trek to the wrath of khan uh, so i'm sure you want to have a more serious conversation uh than that so can you tell us what eugenics is and and why it's important to you Yes, Mr. Dace. Eugenics, quite simply, is the belief in the possibility of improving the qualities of the human species, especially by means of discouraging reproduction in those persons who have genetic defects. What would be a genetic defect? Some form of mental or physical disability, blindness, Down syndrome, would those be physical? Would you consider those uh, defects? You know, um, I have a much broader term. I say feebleness. You know, um, it can uh, it can include all those. Absolutely. Are there uh, what you are alleging sounds conspicuously like Darwin's descent of man? Um, yes. There have been times in history where certain people of certain you you mentioned uh, the Overman, uh, the Superman. Uh, yes. You mentioned that last hour or last segment. There have been times in human history where people have alleged because they're of a certain ethnicity or race. They are therefore superior to others in a certain race or ethnicity that they may feel is uh, are, is defective. Would you agree with that? Yes. And so, you think the way to become serious about that, even though most studies show the world's actually, with the exception of a couple of areas in the third world, is actually underpopulated. The industrialized world is actually underpopulated, but that's a topic for another day. You think the way in order to conquer these issues is through eugenics. So yes. who has, in your view, Mrs. Sanger, who has the who has the perfect DNA strain? Who should we be recreating? Uh, more of, and who should we be procreating less of, in your view? Well, it might. Who be. are the human weeds? 
that H.G. Wells that you just quoted. Who is who's he referring to specifically? You know, the other thing I, I really enjoy about his writing is that he said we really need to cultivate our garden. And I agree with that completely. Um, I would say, you know, we could talk about the Slavs, Latin, Hebrew immigrants are human weeds, you know, dead weight, basically. Latinos, uh, Jews, you think they're, Blacks, they're dead weight? Jews. You think blacks are dead weight? Menace to the race, absolutely. A menace to the human race? Yes. And just, just, just pardon me for a second. Yes. Um, because after you leave here, I'll have to clean up this mess. Yes. Because my name's on the show. So with all due respect uh, to you, I just want to reiterate that the views of our guest are simply her views and not the views of those of us here on this radio program. Most disclaimers say not necessarily. I'll just come right out and say not the views of those of us on this radio show. Please finish your point. Go ahead. Well, but I I must say that my views are absolutely held by a, a tremendous number of high-ranking government officials. Absolutely. And our foreign policy certainly takes into consideration our views on overpopulation and limited resources. In other words, so that you would say that's the reasoning behind why we export abortion and birth control around the world? That's what we're out to do, get rid of these undesirables human weeds? Well, notice how we tie that to financial aid. I'm, 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 again, I'm speechless. I'm just, I, I don't know what to say. It just, I mean, you are looking at this like an actuary looks at a, a, a table of numbers. I mean, this is remorseless when it comes to um, the disregarding of human life. I wouldn't say that because, of course, I am a humanitarian and I know that, in essence, this birth control, for example, is not just uh, an issue for women or this country, but for this world. And yes, it's true that some may die, but it is definitely for the greater good. For the greater good. Who determines what is the greater good? Where, where does that, where do you get your standard for the greater good? Where does it come from? How do you know it's right? Well, I don't know if the listeners understand this, but um, there are those of us in government and in the eugenics movement who have an understanding that we are entrusted with um, continuing the race. And we absolutely believe that, for example, that blacks are genetically inferior, and we believe that they are basically human weeds. The title of our latest project was The Negro Project where we are trying to address the problem of the mass of ignorant Negroes that still breed carelessly, disastrously, so that the increase among Negroes is even more than the increase among whites. And it is from that proportion of the population least intelligent, least fit, and least able to rear children properly. So we decided to hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social services backgrounds and with engaging personalities, you understand, because the most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. One of the most influential, controversial voices uh, in this culture. Uh, the ideas that you've heard her express in this hour have been endemic. They've been foundational to the changes we've seen in our culture in the last couple of generations. Mrs. Sanger, in the few minutes we have remaining with you, you've used a term greater good frequently during our conversation tonight. Can you tell us, can you give us a vision for what the greater good looks like to you? What does that look like? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Dace. When I think of woman and the new race, and I think of birth control and voluntary motherhood, you'll find, I believe, that when motherhood becomes the fruit of a deep yearning, not the result of ignorance or accident, its children will become the foundation of the new race. There will be no killing of babies in the womb by abortion, nor through neglect. Neither will the children die by inches in mills or factories. And no man will dare to break a child's life upon the wheel of toil. When the womb becomes fruitful through the desires of an aspiring love, another Newton will come forth to unlock further the secrets of the earth and the stars. There will come a Plato who will be understood a Socrates who will drink no hemlock, and a Jesus who will not die upon the cross. These and the race that is to be America await upon a motherhood that is to be sacred because it is free. You gave some examples there uh, in and around that uh, flowery and uh, eloquent language. Thank you. Um, 
Sir Isaac Newton's father, I believe, abandoned him. Uh, Jesus was born to an unwed teenage mother. Um, they would seem to fit your uh, definition of what you described to us earlier tonight as defective. And now suddenly they are the examples of what utopia looks like. I'm, forgive me, Mrs. Singer, I'm confused because it would seem to me the examples you're citing actually reinforce my argument that all life is sacred and we uphold that principle. That's when, um, that's when the best moments in human history actually come forth. I, I believe you're actually an heir there. Just think how, mu- how much better our world would be if we had started with, with better stock. Can you imagine how much better it would be? We wouldn't have the overpopulation. We would not have the... Pardon me. How much world, better the world could be? Yes. Other than our Savior? Yes. Because I believe that... You know, I I know that there are those that will hold fast to, you know, the many different beliefs, of course. But if you travel the world as much as I have, you'll understand that most of the religions are very similar in the divine. And I believe that we have the divine in us. And um, when we work that divine out with the good that we're doing here and the humanitarian work that we're doing, then we benefit the world. Mrs. Sanger, in the time we have here remaining, your legacy, when you started out, and there's so much more we could talk to you, but we're running out of time. So when you started this crusade of yours, did you have any idea it would be as influential as it is today? What do you think of your legacy here in America and really throughout all of Western civilization? Well, when I think about stopping the endless suffering when I think about how difficult it is for, and actually if we wanted to talk about sin, if one believed in that, I think, you know, the worst sin is actually to bring a child into the world who, you know, is defective or, you know, if you can't take care of them. So I believe that's an incredible sin. But if you look at the legacy, I think that we're building a better world. We are freeing the feminine spirit and we are allowing her to become a better person and we're having fit children come from fit parents. It's just common sense that we would want to have the best human race going forward. So you view what you have done as humanitarian? Yes, I do, Mr. Dace. Are you proud of what you've done? Are you proud of this legacy? Well, there's always more work that can be done. There's always more women that can be saved from unwanted um, childbearing. Saved from their own children. Saved from a life, save, you know, and I also think of it as saving the children from, you know, perhaps a life of poverty and being unwanted or perhaps diseased. So it is, a, you know, a humanitarian view, yes. What about children born to rich, wealthy, educated people? They don't ever suffer at all? Certainly, when we look at um, those children, we understand that they are given the best possible chance at being able to take care of themselves and to become productive members of society. Hmm. Are you misunderstood? No, I don't believe so. No, I think you've been crystal clear here tonight. That's for sure. Uh, Mrs. Sanger, thank you um, for joining us. Thank you. Um, Obviously, it took a tremendous effort to get you to join us here tonight.